Appreciate your prayers this morning. I do consider it an honor and a privilege to be with you here this morning in this important journey of calling another brother to lead here at Blandon. So we wish the Lord's blessing upon the process of calling another brother. This idea of a qualification message is intriguing in some regards, and yet it's also very, uh, this is a very common thought process. I uh, was recently, or different times, I enjoy perusing just the uh, wanted ads for help wanted for, for job positions. So I pulled a, full to, a few together here this morning just to get our ideas kind of rolling on this idea of qualifications. There's a company called Edge Metalworks. They're based in, outside of New Holland. They're looking for a laser cutting and metal forming operation. Their ideal candidate is trustworthy, loves innovation and challenges, is looking for a career in the metalworking industry. Experience in the metal fabrication industry is a plus, but they are willing to train an engaged individual. Another company called Countertech is looking for manufacturing techs with the following skills or qualifications. Must be able to use measuring tools and apply basic math skills. Must be able to lift or move up to 50 pounds. Pay attention to detail and accuracy. Team player, no experience necessary, we will train. I guess that also applies to their basic math skills and use of measuring tools. No experience necessary, they will train. EB manufacturing, EB trailer manufacturing is looking for trailer mechanics to join their service department. Their qualification inclu includes proper use of hand tools. I really wonder what their definition of proper is. Proper use of hand tools. Read a tape measure, experience with power tools, basic mechanical aptitude, ability to work as a team. And then the oldest hat company in America, Bowman Hat Company, they are looking for distribution associates and the skills needed are experience in picking and packing preferred, ability to lift up to 40 pounds and a team player attitude, attention to detail, and a passion to do things right is a must. Must have reliable transportation. That's one of their qualifications. On the job training is available. So this idea of qualifications for a position or for a job is not something that's new to us. In the, in the faith district, where I would have the opportunity to serve both at Word of Life and, and at Faith, every year we go through a process of filling positions in the church for superintendent, song leading, midweek committee, missions committee, all those different committees. And that process of nominations begins where we put out a document of suggestions for nominations. And it has a list of the different positions that are open and you are expected to put a name or two down for these different positions. Maybe you have that same process here at Blandon. So I'm guessing that as you look at that document and as you look at the positions, you run through your mind different thoughts of who in the church would have the qualifications, who has the skills, the experiences, the giftings needed for this position that I can put a nomination down. The, uh, the idea of the nominations or suggestions for nominations within the church is kind of like a help wanted poster where we put out in the church saying, here are the positions that are open and it's a help wanted poster. The only difference is that you don't really get to volunteer and apply for the position. You get your name put on a slate and you get voted in. So it's a little bit different there. But as you think about it, you, you think about there, there's different skills and abilities and experiences that are needed for one position versus a different one. There's a different qualification needed for song leading versus serving as a trustee. There's a different qualification needed to serve on the midweek committee versus the finance committee. And as you think about that, the, the difference of giftings and skills and abilities that put you as a candidate for one position over another doesn't mean that there's different, that certain positions are better than another. Doesn't mean that certain people in the congregation are better than another. It simply recognizes the facts that we all have different giftings and abilities. And God calls us to different positions, different giftings, different experiences, calls us, gives us the qualifications for different positions in the church. So this morning, as we go through the service here this morning, through prayerful consideration, you're given the opportunity, you're asked to submit a nomination for the position of a minister. So we wanna think about some qualifications of what goes along with what, do, what are the qualifications for a minister that we should be considering. 
And I know as you, as you come into the service, this is not like your first time you're thinking about this. So in a sense, my goal, my desire is maybe to affirm what you are already thinking about as you think about qualifications. There's four qualifications that I'd like to think about this morning. They are commitment, conviction, competency, and character. First qualification of commitment, you can come with me to one verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. We're not going to be parking out in one text in the scripture this morning, but bouncing all over the place. So if, uh, if you're able to, I encourage you to join with me. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Thinking about the qualification of commitment. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The idea of commitment, steadfast, unmovable, is a qualification that I believe is important to note for a minister. And the time that we live, and the era that we live in, we are bombarded day in and day out with all kinds of ideas, suggestions, ideologies, ideologies, all kinds of things are thrown at a person to sway and to push us aside, to distract us, to call us to, here's the latest thing, here's the newest thing that you want to think about. But I believe a minister is called to be steadfast, unmovable rooted and grounded in the work of the Lord, rooted and grounded in the word of the Lord, he has a commitment to what God is calling and what God has said in his word. I'm not talking about one that is stubborn or uncooperative or isn't open to other ideas, isn't open to, to discussing, one that can debate anybody to, to nothing or to shreds. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about one that's not going to get swept along in what's the latest trend. What's the latest big idea? What's the latest hot thing on the, bar, on the market that we need to be pursuing? But it has a commitment to remaining rooted and grounded in the word of the Lord. Steadfast, unmovable. <clears throat> the other idea that 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 brings out here is one that, is, that follows through in doing the work of the Lord. Even when it's toilsome, even when it's difficult, even when the rewards are hard to notice, are hard to see, the commitment to follow through, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The qualification of commitment is one that follows through with what he is asked to do, one that will commit to doing something and does it, always abounding in the work of the Lord. If you need to put a face to the idea of what I am thinking of in commitment, I don't want to embarrass Brother Larry, but that's one that I think about who is committed. I believe you were first ordained in 83, if I saw correctly, has followed through with the work of the Lord. Commitment to the church, commitment to God's standards, commitment to God's principles. And I say that, Brother Larry, to honor you and thank you and bless you for your investment in the church. But that's the idea of commitment. And unfortunately, he's leaving big shoes for the next person to follow in. Literally, too, I guess you could say. <laughs> the idea of commitment, going to follow through, going to do the work of the Lord, it's not in vain. That's the idea we're thinking about, a qualification for a minister. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14, 15, and 16. I also like to think about this idea, it was hinted at here in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, of, of steadfast, unmovable. That also idea comes out here in First Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14, 15, and 16. It's talking about the body. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every work, maketh increase 
of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The idea of commitment that I'm thinking about here this morning is the idea of, of being solid and rooted and grounded, not tossed to and fro. Henceforth, my children, the, henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. That idea that everything that comes along the way, we follow after, but rooted and grounded, committed to God's word. Committed to following through with God's word, even if it involves, in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. The day and age that we live in, truth is pushed against, particularly God's truth. The word of God is pushed against at all times. Pushed against very, very vehemently is the word of God pushed against. And God's standards, as we were talking about this morning in the ideas of marriage and what God calls us to, and the principles of marriage is pushed against, is debated. And there are times where we need to speak the truth in love, but we have that commitment. It's what we're looking for and a qualification to following through with that. Of course, the most important aspect of commitment in qualification message for the role of a minister is one's commitment to his walk with God. His commitment to walking with God day in and day out. Acts chapter 3, they were to look out, they were, wherefore brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom ye may be able to appoint over this business. Commitment to God, one's relationship with Jesus Christ is foundational as a qualification for a minister. Most important thing is a relationship with Jesus Christ. One that has a commitment to walking with God at all times is very, very critical. It's foundational. So qualification for minister, the first one I want to think about is the idea of commitment. One who is committed to his walk with God. One who is steadfast, unmovable, not swayed back and forth, but committed to God and his word to walk with God. The second idea, the second qualification I want to think about this morning is conviction. Conviction. Now this, this idea of conviction I'm thinking about also has some pretty good overlap with commitment, some very close ideas. But there's a main idea that we want to grab a hold of here which is referenced in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, and also ver chapter 2, verse 1. So go with me to Titus chapter 1, thinking about the qualification of com conviction. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Hold fa holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Jump down to chapter 2, verse 1. Paul tells Titus to, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now twice Paul uses this phrase, sound doctrine. I'm not a, I'm not a Greek scholar. So, and I'm not also very much of an English major, but I guess the idea is that sound is an adjective to bring, to define or to broaden out the idea of doctrine, sound doctrine. And the word sound here, as I understand it, has the implication or the idea of being in good health, uncorrupt or true, wholesome. So Paul is telling Timothy that we are to be looking for one that has sound doctrine. The qualification of conviction is one that is rooted and grounded in the doctrine of God's Word. His doctrine, what he believes, is in alignment with God's Word. And he's solid on it. He has conviction for it. His conviction is in the doctrines of the Scripture. Daniel Kaufman, in his book, Doctrines of the Bible, asks the questions. He says, how can a minister speak the things that become sound doctrine, as it says there in verse in verse chapter 2, verse 1, speak the things that become sound doctrine when he himself is unsound. How can he by sound doctrine used in his arguments and teaching convince the gainsayer when he himself does not subscribe to soundness of doctrine? Daniel Kaufman also likens this idea of soundness of a minister's doctrine to the soundness of a main beam of a building. And I like that idea, I like that analogy because Recently, we did, a, we did a small remodel project in our home. This is the, 
I guess the latest fad or the trend where you knock out some walls and open up some floor space and uh, you know, it's the open room concept. And so we removed two walls in our, in our house. And part of that process, since the one wall was deemed load bearing, part of that process was they put a beam in. Well, there was lumber that we removed out of that wall that we tore out. They didn't use that to put the beam in. They went out and they bought new lumber for it. That's because they wanted something that was sound, something that was solid, something that they knew the structure of the house could bear upon. And that's the idea that is thought about here with this with sound doctrine, the qualification of conviction. The church, the integrity of the church weighs upon the conviction of the leadership. The structure of the church is bared by the conviction of the leadership, not solely and exclusively, but they play an integral part in the foundation and in the structure, the stability and the health of the church. This is why it is important that a minister show sound doctrine, the qualification of conviction for the role of a minister. Now part of the process of an, inord of an ordination and maybe it's the most tedious process, is those that are nominated, those that are chosen to be part of the class, they're asked to fill out a doctrinal statement or a statement of faith, a doctrinal questionnaire. And um, it, is a, it is a task. It's a, it's a job to do. There's a lot of questions and you think and you wrestle with it. And then that gets reviewed by Ted and he reads that with his teacher lens and his scrutiny lens and he fine tooth through it with a fine tooth comb and he picks out every word. No, not quite maybe that bad. I'm not quite sure how. But the goal is, is looking to ensure that the doctrine is sound for the health and the stability of church. It's not that Ted is, is trying to upset things or that the ministry team is trying to upset things, but to ensure the soundness of, of, the, of the minister, of the potential candidate for minister, that his doctrine is sound, that he has conviction, he knows what he believes. He is rooted and grounded in the scriptures and the conviction of what the, the doctrines of the scripture. He knows what he believes about creation, about marriage, about baptism, about Jesus and his death and his resurrection and the virgin birth, all that is so important for the integral structure and health and stability of the church. And I appreciate that process. While it's tedious, it takes time, it is very valuable to ensure the conviction of a brother that is being considered for the, for the role of a minister. And I believe, as I mentioned, kind of referenced to earlier in the message today here, this idea that we need conviction for sound doctrine is imperative in the time that we are living in. In the days that are ahead, it was talked about, you know, are we in the end times or we are in the end times. In the days that are ahead, that, that solid conviction and sound doctrine is vital. Very important for the health and the well-being and the stability of the church. So we talked about commitment. We talked about conviction. We're going to think about competency now. Competency. The qualification of competency is observing. Is a person qualified? Do they have they demonstrated the ability, the skill set to lead as in the work of a minister? Now going back to, the, uh, to the, the, the job postings that I referenced in the beginning of the message here, we talked about the different positions that are open in, in the business world, different positions in the church, and that part of observing qualifications, does the person have what it takes for the job? Do they know how to use hand tools properly? Do they know how to read a tape measure? Those qualifications for that job is the competency that they have for that position. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3 verses 4, 5, and 6 have some input on competency, the skill set, the abilities that are needed for the role of a minister. First Timothy chapter three, verse four. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now again, these verses are in the, the context of a bishop, but I believe they're also very applicable to the role of a minister. Again, referencing Daniel Kaufman, he says, since the ministry 
is responsible for the execution of God's order in the church and the discipline of its members, as well as the general leadership of the body of Christ, it is mandatory that a man give evidence of the ability to lead and govern before placing him in the office of the ministry. He's talking about competency. Having the ability, has demonstrated the ability to leave and to lead. And Paul likens that or says one way you can look at that is how does the man rule in his own house? Now, if the fathers that are here this morning are anything like me, you start to squirm and wiggle because if somebody's going to judge my ability to lead in how I lead my own house, well, then I better sit down because I certainly am not perfect in that realm. I think many times if there is any area in which I am the weakest leader, I don't know if the right word, or, or just I fail at leadership, it's at home because it seems that I don't know why it is that way, but um, I shudder to think when Paul talks about the ability to lead, we are to look at the man's family to see if he is qualified to lead. So I think it, it's important to evaluate. It's important to look at. However, the disclaimer, the qualification I would maybe put with that idea, not trying to water down Paul's words or water down what Paul is calling us to, but let's not expect and let's not hold leadership families to a different standard than what we're willing to uphold in our own families. If I'm not willing to expect that kind of lifestyle in my family, I shouldn't expect it out of my leader's family as either. So that idea that, yes, we look at a family, but let's also weigh in, am I willing to live? Am I willing to strive for that as well? Second idea that Paul says here for the idea of competency, he says in verse 6, he says, not a novice, Left, lest being lifted up in pride, he fall in the condemnation. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. This idea of not a novice, not one that's newly converted, not one that's newly joined to the church, or one that has newly or freshly moved into a community, hasn't had the time to prove for himself or the soundness of his faith and doctrine. I believe it's very important for a potential leader to be well known by the people that he is going to lead, that he is called to lead before he's put into the position of leadership, that he's well known by the congregation. This is why I shudder or I question or I wonder sometimes that churches that they hire in a pastor from the outside might have the skills and abilities or the what looks like he's all, all qualified for, but is he traveling in the same direction as the church? Is he on board with the the, the guidelines and the, the doctrines of the church, and is he headed the same direction? The idea of not a novice mostly applies, I believe, to not new in the faith, but I believe it's also important that we analyze, we, we look at, are they traveling in the direction that we as a church want to go? Are they on a spiritual journey that aligns with who we as a church want to be? And this is why I, I deeply appreciate the practice of choosing leadership from among us. Because we're familiar with, you're familiar with the person. You're familiar with, you've been able to observe their, their lifestyle and know you're going to know that they're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but you can see their desire to lead, to be a part of the church, and to be a part of God's plan for their life. Observe the qualification of competency. Does he have the skill set, the abilities to lead in your congregation? So we talked about three qualifications so far. Commitment. Is he steadfast on the word of God, committed to his walk with God? Conviction, does he know what he believes in the doctrines of God's word? Competency, does he have the skill set and abilities to lead? And the fourth one we look at this morning is the idea of character. Character. I believe that next to one's walk with Jesus, one's character is probably one of the most important qualifications to take a look at one's character. 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, again in the context of a bishop, Paul says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And if we go back again, join me back in Titus actually, let's flip back there a few pages. This idea of character, Paul broadens out very, very definitively in Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, follow along. For this cause left I thee in Crete, 
that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain, ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, and the steward of God, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. Gainsayers, excuse me. Twice here, actually two times here in, in Titus, and also in 1 Timothy, Paul uses the word blameless. Blameless when it comes to character. And that's a, that's a very big word in the realm of character. One that is blameless. I do see here in, 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 uh, in Titus that it's kind of pointed in two directions. One kind of ties in with our Sunday school lesson this morning. In verse 6, he says, blameless, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife. So I think the idea of one idea, one thread of the, the call for blameless is in morality and faithfulness in marriage. The husband of one wife. Then he says, blameless, in verse 7, blameless as the steward of God. One that upholds the scriptures, one that upholds the callings of God. Again, Daniel Kaufman says, this is not to say that one is living above criticism, but he must be free from worldly spots, excuse me, worldly spots and above blame. Notice the difference he's differentiating between criticism and blame. Blameless. And thinking about the qualification of character, I believe this is where the saying, actions speak louder than words, really comes into play. Actions speak louder than words. Paul goes on in First Timothy, I'm sorry, in Titus here, and he lists off a long list of character qualifications for us to consider. Qualifications, looking at one's character. Verse 7, he begins there in verse 7, he says, blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not one that's dogmatic or soon impatient or unyielding, contradiction, can't tolerate differing viewpoints, knows what he believes, is solid, but yet is able to discuss and to dialogue, not dogmatic or self-willed, not soon angry, one that is not with a, a temper that flares up, but rather sweet-tempered, not given to wine, no striker, isn't argumentative or quarrelsome, not given to filthy lucre, not one that is driven by money. These are character qualifications that we should be considering. Driven by money or greed to gain. Lover of hospitality. Friendly, one that is friendly, one that is warm, enjoys people. Lover of good men. I like that concept. Lover of good men. If I understand it correctly, the idea is one that loves and promotes that which is good. That which is good. Loves and promotes it. This says lover of good men, but the idea here in the word meanings, if I understand it correctly, is one that loves and promotes that which is good. One that pushes others forward, encourages, blesses them, encourages them on their way. Sober, just, holy, temperate, or self-controlled. Holding fast the faithful words. We talked about conviction, commitment, stable, steadfast. Able to exhort and to convince because of sound doctrine. When I look at what Paul lays out here to Titus, this is a high bar of qualifications that Paul lays out. A list that is important to bear in mind as we think about the qualification of character this morning and the opportunity of suggestions for nominations or for nominations for minister. So we looked at four, we looked at four qualifications. Commitment, is he steadfast on the word of God, committed to his walk with God? Conviction, does he know what he believes? Rooted and grounded in the doctrines of God word, God's word. Competency. Does he have the skill set, the abilities to lead? And character. Is he able to lead by example? The first two qualifications that we look at, commitment and conviction, they're, they're internal. They're heart settings. They're beliefs that are kind of hard to get a good read on. The other qualifications of external competency and character, they're more they're evident. Ones that we can easily, more easily see. One thought I have here as we come to a close for the message is the danger that I realize and with a, a message 
a qualification message is as we look at scriptures, the bar is very high. Paul sets the bar, the scriptures, the apostolic, the, the pastoral epistles, sets the bar very high when it comes to the leadership positions. And the question then comes up, well, well who can attain? And I, I, I look at these qualifications and I say, what were people thinking when they nominated me for a position of leadership? I'm not, I'm not preaching God's word this morning or sharing from God's word to say that, well, you know, here in Blandon, your picking choices are very slim. That's not the case at all. Men do qualify for leadership. Men do qualify, and I think it has a lot to do with their heart's desire to serve and as God calls them. They've been on a journey of following God. They are committed to following God no matter where it takes them. They're not perfect. They're not, they're, they, have, they have faults. They have failures. They have weaknesses that they're working on. That doesn't disqualify them. That simply means that God's grace is sufficient to use us as he enables us, as he calls us. Someone has said it's not a matter of perfection, but of direction. What direction are we headed? What direction are you walking? Are we moving toward greater and greater Christ-likeness? Are we striving to be more and more like Jesus every day? That heart setting qualifies us for a work in the church of God. There are skills and abilities that are very important, but God also works with us as we have that heart bent on following God, no matter what the cost, no matter what it means, no matter what I need to learn, no matter what attitudes or characteristics I need to, to work on, I'm going to follow God. So I don't want to raise the bar so high that we say, well, it's unattainable, and the, the person that God has put in my mind, well, he doesn't fit. That's not the idea. The idea is, are we looking, are we learning, are we striving to be more and more like Jesus every day? These qualifications in Scripture are very important, and we bear in mind. But we also want to allow God to move and work through you as part of the church and say, yes, this person has the abilities. He has what fits. He has the found work. He has the, aptitude, the foundation, the aptitude, and God can use him because his heart is focused on following God. The other part that comes along with this that I think about when it comes to qualification message and or just the idea of the work of the church is that all of us should be striving to be more and more like Jesus each and every day. Not just those that are called to leadership, not just those that are fulfilling positions in the church, but each and every one of us should be striving to, to be more and more like Jesus and then willing to serve in the church as God calls. Willing to serve. My prayer this morning that as we go through the the rest of the service here that we would continue to be in a state, uh, a state and an attitude of prayer, asking God to lead, asking God to direct through the voice of the church. And so as we close here this morning, I'd just like to spend a moment in prayer and I invite you to, to stand for a word of prayer and then I'll turn it back over to Ted uh, following prayer. Father God, as we come before you this morning, we are grateful for your church. We are grateful for Jesus and for his sacrifice on the cross and for instituting the work of the church. And Father, we pray that you would be with the congregation here at Blandon this morning. Father, we pray that your voice, your direction could be heard through the voice of the church here this morning. I thank you, God, for each brother, each sister, each family that is a part of the church here at Blandon. And God, I thank you that you care and you're very interested in the work here. We pray, God, as we go through the process here that your name ultimately will be honored and glorified. We look to you for direction. We trust you as the sovereign God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.